형님 깊은 골로 대한짐생이 내려온다 봄은 더울 숭덜숭 우리는 잔뜩 한 발이 넘고 해머리 흔들며 전동 같은 앞다리 동화 같은 뒷발로 양계 채워지고 새락 같은 발톱으로 잔님 뿌리 왕모래를 차르르르 흩치며 조금덕 흘리고 허리랑 하는 소리 하늘이 무너지고 땅이 톡 꺼진 한듯 차례 정신없이 목으로 움츠리고 가만히 엎젖겄다 벙 내려온다 봄이 내려온다 봄님 깊은 골로 한지 생이 내려온다 두의 머리를 흔들며 양이 축질져지고 몸은 얼쑥덜쑥 꼬리는 잔뜩 한 마리 온도 동의 가득 합다리 전도 같은 빗다리 전화 같은 발을 도으로 온도 사람의 생각으로 잔이 뿌리와 모래 Hello, everyone, and welcome to New Narratives, Korean American Art and Activism, a benefit for Nakasek and Adoptees for Justice. My name is Jimmy Byrne, and it's a pleasure to be your MC this evening. Nakasek was founded in 1994 by Korean grassroots community organizations that wanted a national entity to lead campaigns for immigrant rights. Today, our network is comprised of Hana Center in Illinois, Minkwan Center in New York, New Jersey, Uri Center in Pennsylvania, Uri Juntos in Texas, and Hamke Center in Virginia. And together, we have been a leader among Korean and Asian Americans in the immigrant justice movement for the past three decades, an important part of which has been our project Adoptees for Justice, advocating for citizenship rights for all intercountry adoptees. We appreciate this opportunity to celebrate our 30th anniversary with you all. Thank you for being here. I'd also like to acknowledge our sponsors and host committee. You have all helped to make this fundraiser a huge success. No matter the amount, we appreciate everyone's support in joining our journey to justice. For those who have capacity to give a little more, please consider making a contribution throughout the program. And you can also purchase raffle tickets to win some fabulous prizes that were donated by our panelists. All you need to do is scan the QR code at the top of our backgrounds or click the link in the chat. Winners will be contacted tomorrow. And if you have questions for our panel, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Our moderator will try to get to as many as possible. I'd now like to hand it over to Nakasek's board chair to share a few words. Welcome, Imok Sanim. Good evening. My name is John Sung Lee. I am one of the founding members of Nakasek, and I cannot believe we have reached our 30th anniversary. I first came to the United States in 1978 and landed in Denver, Colorado where I was able to find other Koreas, believe it or not. As I met with more and more Korean immigrants around the country, we sought to support the pro-democracy movement in South Korea and recognizing that we needed to build power among Koreans in the United States. We eventually founded a NACASAC to lead campaign for immigrant rights. Our four core values are live right, know your roots, live strong, and live together. Some of the other co-founders are here tonight, and we believed that if we embrace these values in everything we did, we would build a multi-generational, multi-racial movement that will achieve a better world for all of us. Now, 30 years later, I am so proud of what we have accomplished and how we have adapted and continue to adapt to meet the needs of our immigrant community. We give thanks to all of our event sponsors and thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. I will now turn it over to Nakasek co-directors, Becky Belkoa and Jung-woo Kim. 
Thank you, Imok Sanim and Anya Seo. Hello, everyone. We appreciate all of you. The last year has been so productive and we could have not done it without your support. We co-organized three national community building and educational convenings, one in Houston for our entire network from six states, one in California for our undocumented leaders, and one in Colorado to build Asian and Black relationships with the Undocu Black Network. Through our Citizenship for All campaign, we defended DACA, urged legislators to create a pathway to citizenship through adjusting the registry, and advocated to recapture family-based visas with the Value Our Families Coalition. And through our adoptee-led project, Adoptees for Justice, we educated legislators and the public about the Adoptee Citizenship Act, conducted over 150 legislative visits, including a trip to DC just a few weeks ago, and provided mutual aid, legal support, and other services for intercountry adoptees without citizenship. Thanks to your support, we're able to continue this important work. And now, Chungwoo will share about our plans for this year. We appreciate all of your support, and we need you in this critical year for our communities. The Nakasek Network will be throwing down for the 2020 elections in Illinois, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Virginia. We need all hands on deck to reach out to voters, engage them in conversation about issues that matter to them the most, and encourage them to vote. We also need to combat the misleading disinformation that is targeted at our community. The theme of our event this evening is New Narrative, and it is very appropriate for our work this coming year. Many forces are trying to make it look like immigrants are the problem. We must share our stories and uplift new narrative that truthfully represent our beautiful immigrant community. And as Reverend Lee said, we must build a multi-racial movement towards a more just and equitable world for everyone. Together, we can do it. I will now pass it back to Jimmy. Thank you, Becky and Jungwoo. That's right, now is the time for new narratives about what it means to belong as Asian Americans in this country. We're too often labeled a model minority and the perpetual foreigner. And one of the most powerful ways to take action is to tell our own stories. Both activism and storytelling can take many forms. And who better to speak to this than artists whose work connects hearts and minds around universal issues in unique ways. We are honored this year to partner with a diverse panel of Korean American artists, including members of Korean American Artist Collective. Their mission is to provide resources and opportunities for Korean American artists to collaborate and tell their stories. Providing the support will build solidarity and bring about a more just and liberatory future. The collective has been a generous supporter of NACASEC and other social justice organizations, and I encourage everyone to check out the beautiful work available in their online store some of which is hanging on the walls in my home. I am now going to pass it over to the extraordinary Hannah Bay, whom I had the pleasure of meeting in New York uh, just a few weeks ago, along with Colleen. Uh, Hannah is going to introduce the other panelists and moderate our discussion. Welcome, Hannah. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. This is amazing to see. So my name is Hannah Bay. I'm a Korean American journalist, nonfiction writer, and an illustrator based in New York. I've been an admirer of Nakasek's work for many years now, and seeing that slideshow at the beginning of this program was really moving. I'm a member of the Korean American Artist Collective, and I was so pleased to contribute to the Chung portfolio that benefited Nakasek and other community groups. That was one of my most uh, meaningful experiences when it comes to the theme of art and activism. And uh, that Chung portfolio was all about us as Korean American artists uh, mobilizing in our grief to pool our work after the Atlanta killings to do something big to build up our communities. In journalism, which is the field where I started out, activism is really frowned upon. So I'm really glad that I get to work in more creative spaces now and um, to get more involved in political activism. So for the raffle, I'll be contributing a set of 20 postcards from my collaborative illustration project, Eat, Drink, Draw, which is created by me and Adam Olsner. The postcards you might get would might be a little bit different um, from the ones that are pictured here but it'll be a nice variety. And I'm so grateful to all of you for supporting NACASEC and Adoptees for Justice. So I'll go ahead and start introducing our panelists for the evening, um, beginning with Eun Soo Chung. 
So Unsu Chong is a Los Angeles-based artist and the creator of Corey Angry, a comic slash zine series based on her daily struggles as a Korean American. The Corey Angry zine illustrates Unsu's beautiful yet complicated life journey as an immigrant, told through this character, Corey Angry, and she's photographed with handmade props in a set. The Corey Angry character is a seven inch doll slash puppet slash armature of Unsu, and she has tackled all these kinds of topics like immigrant rights and how to interact with ICE during a raid, which you can see pictured here. She's also made wonderful, irreverent comics on anti-Asian racism and sexual harassment and the history of Black Asian solidarity. What I personally love the most about Unsu's work is that she uses humor and a deep understanding and knowledge about the facts to reach fans and make them feel included as she explores these issues. Um, Unsu, you're an avid reader, and I think that's related to your raffle item for tonight. So could you tell us about it, please? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. And thank you, Hannah, for such a wonderful, lovely uh, introduction for myself. So I will be raffling um, my dear uh, uh, bookcase that I made. I tried to kind of go over all the books I've read and I realized during pandemic, um, I haven't read much of a Korean American book. So I decided to dedicate a bookcase about most of a Korean American, written by Korean American authors and the books that I've read in my childhood. So those are miniature books. Um, it will come with the bookcase and then the frame, the clear frame. Um, it took a really long time for me to kind of put it together and I just felt like so much love for it. So if, I'm really glad that this um, beautiful bookcase will be raffled off to this good cause. Thank you so much, Unsu. It's such a meaningful contribution. So I'm so grateful. Um, and everyone, if you want to follow Unsu online, her handle, um, which is also in her Zoom background, is Corey Angry um, on social media. So please keep in touch with Unsu. Next, I'm happy to introduce Adam Hansi Fuentes. Adam Hansi Fuentes, she slash they, is a fiber social practice and performance artist and educator based in Chicago who creates participatory projects around themes of protest, voting rights, citizenship, and immigrant justice. Much of her work revolves around skill sharing, specifically sewing techniques to create spaces for empowerment, subversion, and protest. Since 2016, her protest banner lending library has helped people make thousands of banners and workshops, and it's created lending libraries of donated protest banners. Autumn is also a NACASEC board member, and she has worked with Chicago affiliate Hana Center through a project called Citizenship for All, Storytelling Through Nongi Making, which uses these Korean folk banners called Nongi toward collective work to achieve immigrant and racial justice. I'm excited for you all to learn more about Adam and her truly interdisciplinary work tonight. But first, Adam, can you please tell us about your contribution to the raffle? Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. So. I sewed together a banner bag. So it is a bag that's uh, double-sided and then you unzip the sides and it turns into a double-sided banner that says on one side, no justice and on the other side, no peace. That is so rad, I love this. Thank you so much, Adam. Next up is Alex Myung. Alex Myung is an LA-based animator and a filmmaker whose work finds new intersections within his queer Korean adoptee status. It is often informed by the decade he spent working as a technical designer in New York for fashion houses such as Diane von Furstenberg, Tori Birch, 3.1 Philip Lim, and DKNY. Here's a look at some of Alex's stunning personal work. And um, Alex is also a lead background designer for an upcoming Netflix animated series. And his animated talents tie into his raffle contribution tonight. Alex, can you tell us about the piece that you're contributing to the raffle? Yeah, um, so this is a poster for my short film, Arrival. Uh, it is um, a film that I did, came out in 2016. It premiered at the Seattle 
International Film Festival and went on to screen it uh, a little over 20 international film festivals. It currently has 4 million views on YouTube. Um, and it's about a young man uh, struggling to come out to his mother and how it begins to affect his relationship with his partner. So I will be contributing this lovely 11 by 17 uh, signed poster. Um, so if you want that hanging on your wall, you know, act now. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. I loved Arrival so much. And I'm happy to share that Alex is currently working on his second animated short film. It's called Home Game. And it's about an adoptee who is forced to confront his existence while out buying milk. And I can't wait to see it. <laughs> so <laughs> next, I am pleased to introduce our final panelist, who is Colleen Peck. Colleen Peck is an artist, designer, and writer based in NYC. She's also a member of the Korean American Artist Collective. In 2015, Colleen supported a delegation of international women crossing the Korean DMZ to call for an end to the Korean War. It's an experience that has had a profound impact on her perspective and her work. Colleen has been making experimental animated short films for the past four years screening at Brooklyn Academy of Music, Everyman Theater in London, and in domestic and international film festivals. Her latest short, Amma Nada, Motherland, is a six minute meditation on grief and loss on a personal and national level. She's now working on an essay collection called Absences, and the first in this series was published last month in Roxanne Gay's The Audacity. She documents her creative process on a bi-weekly substack called The Line Between. Today, Colleen is donating an original art print from her 2022 film, Chame. It's a two and a half minute short in the oral history tradition featuring multiple generations of women in her family. It's narrated by her mother, who's remembering her own grandmother about the time that she was pregnant with Colleen. Uh, Colleen, can you share a few words about the original art that you're donating to the raffle, please? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Hannah, for that kind introduction. Um, first of all, I just want to echo what everyone um, has been saying, which is just um, just thank you for, for having us and just really excited to contribute um, and support this important work that, that Nakasek is doing. Um, so as Hannah mentioned, I'll be donating an original fine art print to the raffle. Um, it's called temong, and temong is a word in Korean that describes uh, a dream where an unborn child appears to the mother uh, as an animal. It's kind of the Korean version of the gender reveal, I guess. Um, and it's uh, a still from my film Chame. Uh, the film that Hannah was just talking about where, and it's a moment where this old woman, my great grandmother transforms into a series of these really powerful beasts as she sets off on this journey to procure this out of season Korean summer fruit, chame, uh, to fulfill pregnancy cravings of my mother when she was pregnant with me. And so this image captures this, um, pretty dramatic shift into uh, this journey. And it's a manifestation of what I like to think of as the strength or power of the love my great grandmother had for my mom, um, the kind that we call Chong Song in Korean. And the print is 11 by 17 inches, uh, including the white border that accommodates matting. The artwork itself is eight by 14, I believe. And it's printed on German etching art paper, um, which is pretty thick, luxurious. You know, it's printed with fade resistant archival grade uh, ink. And it's um, one of a limited edition of eight, meaning that there's only gonna be eight of these out in this form in the world. So whoever gets it, you know, you'll have one of them and I hope you really enjoy it. I'm super humbled to offer it as a gift to Nakasek for the raffle. Thank you so much, Colleen. Everyone, I am so excited to speak with you about your incredible art. I'm so glad I got to introduce you and the work that you do. So just to get started with this conversation, I would love to hear 
what Korean American art and activism mean to you as individuals? So anyone can start and, and jump in. I guess I could start. Um, so Korean American art, this kind of reminds me of a conversation that uh, we had for during an informational meeting that we had for KAC like a year ago or something like that before I was a member. Um, it was for prospective members. There was a bunch of us and there was Dave who was uh, who's the co-founder, one of the co-founders of uh, KAC. And I myself asked this question, I remember, which was, you know, are there any prerequisites for being a member of KAC uh, in terms of the art that we make? Like, what does it mean to make Korean American art? Like, do we have to have like, do the themes that we really work with have to be explicitly Korean or Korean American? Does it have to, do we have to exhibit explicit Korean elements? Like, what is that? What are Korean themes? And at the end of the day, I think that, um, you know, what makes Korean American art Korean American is that Korean Americans make them. <laughs> um, and I think that there's, you know, so much that we're all so different. And, it, you know, the beautiful thing is that the spectrum has the capacity to be so broad. And yet there's like unity and so much variation and, and difference. So, um, I'll stop here so that others have a chance to speak too. But. Yeah, I remember in our planning call that we all did um, that we talked about how we're so not a monolith and we can really see that in this panel. Um, for me, it's been really important to, um, to reconnect with our histories. And I know that's something that has meant mm -hmm. a lot to, to each of you. So um, if anyone else wants to join in and talk about what art and activism mean to you, uh, I'll, I can go. Uh, so, uh, I think activism, you know, it exists in a space where there is some sort of oppressive system, right? And, you know, the two ways in which these systems, you know, guard themselves from change is through erasure and displacement. And so when I'm thinking about all of this in terms of my position as like a Korean American adoptee and, the motives, whatever they are behind this nationwide expulsion of children, you know, across the globe, not only have we been physically displaced and disconnected from one each from, you know, one another, but we've also lost this access to national and familial history. And so, you know, what, like you were saying, Hannah, you know, this is an imposed erasure of our past, and that is the oppressive system. And you know, when that extends further and you're talking about queer adoptees like myself who are even more isolated from each other or have been ostracized ostracized even within adoptee spaces, it's like this whole other level to all of it. And um, for the film that I'm working on, um, I've been a little frenzied just trying to absorb as much Korean fine art and technological achievements and knowledge that I just feel like I was never exposed to even having gone to adoptee camps growing up and learning about pungmul and learning about Korean food and folk tales and um you know through my mentors and other queer adoptees who have by the way been consistently at the forefront of adoptee and Korean American activism work I've just come to understand that that in of itself is just a form of activism. Just the simple act of me learning about my cultural past, even if I don't end up making this film, just being able to understand my position in the world as a Korean person through art, no matter how big or small, it just makes a huge difference because I will take that knowledge with me and it will affect me in unquantifiable ways, even if it's subconscious and, you know, because never in a million years did the US or Korea think that the internet would exist and we would find each other and start questioning the morality of our adoptions and its potential role in Korea's ascension to, you know, being what is now a global power. Yeah. Adam, I see you unmuted. Yeah, I can <laughs> I can jump in. Yeah, I, I love these answers. And yeah, as a Korean American artist, um, you can see that my my art uh, centers around activism, right? Really working toward 
uh, social justice for all and using art as a tool for that. And so, you know, art and activism are really the driving force for everything that I do, right? It is a driving force for my pedagogy, my research, art practice, my writings. And art and activism are really where my communities are at right? But where I feel nourished and taken care of. And yeah, so Korean American activism and art is, like you said, Hannah, like a way for me to also connect with our roots as Koreans and Korean Americans, right? Where we have a long ongoing practice of art and culture that centers community and collaboration. And we have such a long history of powerful activism and resistance. And so those are something that really give me inspiration as a Korean American artist who uses art for activism. I, I love that. I, I What I really see in your work, Adam, is this like invitation to others to learn practices, to share, to borrow. Um, it's it's so beautiful to see. And and Unsu, I feel like you have done so much to really make um activism and history and uh knowing how to stand up for ourselves so much part of your work. Um can you tell us a little bit about how you were able to connect with that? Yeah, I'm actually I was really afraid to speak up a lot of things um growing up. Um I wasn't really allowed to talk about my immigration status. I was formerly undocumented. And so I don't even know when I started my activism post. Um, I think that like naturally um, by being undocumented status itself was just politically like somehow I was engaged in that already. Um, and having my character as like a moniker to using that to talk about issues that was really like eating inside um, was really re refreshing and it was reframing of this um, frustration and it kind of gave me more courage and courage to reject and courage to kind of redefine the story that I've been told. Um, I just wanted to do it for myself and somehow it touched um, more people and they could I gotten a lot of good connection from my work because I think part of it is because I don't put my face on it honestly um, it's a character that anybody can place themselves into and um, I think the activism is the fact that like that you don't necessarily have to um, go on a physical protest there's different ways to be engaged in activism and sometimes people forget that um a lot their translation work is part of the activism there is a lot of like other ways to be engaged in activism and i used to do i chose to do it in a comic format um where people can maybe think about it what i'm talking about and adding a little bit of humor doesn't always um hurt so that's where my activism um lies in yeah, I love that. I feel like just the fact of your existence as a formerly undocumented person is political. Um, and I feel like so much of your art and uh, its political leanings come from that history. Um, so for the other artists on the panel, I, I'm curious as to whether there was an issue or a moment that you felt called to activism in your practice. Um, was there anything that drew you in particular? I can go first. <laughs> um, so I actually went to, before my comics, I was struggling with my work um, in my career and I felt like I wasn't, I was like, something was missing in my life and it was my late twenties. And I came across United Way Dream Conference in 2014 in Houston. And I just had like a calling that it just drew me to like, just go and, just kind of see, and it was my first time seeing like thousands of undocumented immigrants um, having this conference in Houston to talk about the political agenda and like share information. And what shocked me was it was not only, um, they weren't there just for themselves, but the parents and uh, future generations. So like seeing being in a space where I see myself in all these people made me, I, something was like, I guess like engaging and something sparked me. Um, and it kind of led me to do like 
my first like public interview with LA Times about it. And then it kind of started to um, make me realize what is my role in this in this space and time? What can I do as an artist to kind of amplify these voices? And that um, I think it's when I started to think about more deeply about what I want to say and what I think I could help with. Um, so that kind of led me to it. And I think it was also very shocking to see so many intersectionality of undocumented immigration status um, crossroads. There's Undocu Black, there was a lot of Korean American, actually, not a lot, but like a, a group of Korean American immigrants fighting for this. I was like really inspired that and and it just kind of gave me some kind of, um, I guess, inspiration for moving forward. I, I'm so glad that you used the word intersectional because um, that, that's what I imagine when I think of you, you attending this conference for dreamers. Um, like for me in 2016, seeing the results of that presidential election, um, I attended my first immigrant rights teaching and that was the first time I ever heard from a Korean American speaker saying that they were undocumented. To me, that had not been my understanding of, um, of the problems with our immigration system, but it, it really made me want to seek out more information and to be more involved. Um, Adam, I know you started your protest banner lending library in 2016. I'm curious as to whether you had been politically active in your art before that, or if that was a real turning point for you? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I would say that um, it started much earlier for me. So I come from quite an activist family. My parents were really active in the student protests in Korea in the 70s and 80s. And so it's kind of in my blood. And <laughs> when we moved to the United States, I grew up in the Central Valley in California with a lot of in farmland, right? And so growing up in that sort of space made me really aware of um, so much that was wrong with our immigration system, you know, so much that like, yeah, so I grew up amongst these like Latin A activists fighting for immigrant and labor rights, right? And so I think that was really important for me um, in terms of how I see the world. And, you know, I remember like in high school, my best friends were Salvadorian, Filipino, Palestinian, like Cham. And it was like, I was already aware of US intervention and imperialism because that's why we were all there, you know? And so I remember that, like I said, like learning about the United Farm Workers Movement at a pretty young age, like, I learned about activism in diasporic communities fighting for immigrant and racial and economic justice. And so, like I said, it's a place where like the conditions of immigrant labor and, um, you know, it, it, it's very visible. And so I became politicized at a young age. And um, I remember, you know, that was what I was really interested in high school and uh, from there, my natural trajectory was that I then went to UC Berkeley <laughs> and continued to be very polit politically active. And then I actually was, you know, more <laughs> studying uh, Latin American studies with the focus on immigration policy, actually. And I stumbled into art classes. And then I, I saw how art can really be a, such a powerful tool for activism and for fighting for change. And that's how I became an artist. Well, that's so beautiful that it really started with the activism first for you. And it really is like entrenched in your blood. That's amazing. Um, Alex, I was really moved by how passionately you spoke about um, adoptee citizenship rights. And that's one of the issues that brings us here together tonight. Um, can you tell us about like when that issue like reached your consciousness and um, and and just like how your art has responded to um, your, your, you know, growing knowledge of your identity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to emphasize the growing. <laughs> it is, it is organic and ongoing. Um, but I think, you know, I think for all of us here as artists, there's just, you know, we're constantly thinking about like, what don't we see in the world? Like what is hidden that we see, like, you know, 
whether it's something that your community wants to see or it's something that you as a person uniquely see, like how are you seeing the world? What is hidden? What can we unearth? And, you know, I made my first film because I just wanted to see an animated movie about two modern gay people. And I think when you're from a marginalized community, it's like, it is so difficult to ignore the lack of you that exists narratively in the world. It's just impossible to escape that. And especially after you realize that you're actually not the only one like you, like there are, you know, there are 200,000 adoptees, global adoptees in the world. And the amount of people that that affects, the amount of families that that affects is immense. Like it is a number that is beyond <laughs> what we can really fathom. Um, and so, you know, I think for me, it just, it, it was very accidental. You know, it's like, I'm just trying to write things where, you know, I, I don't want to like rehash anything. So I'm like, okay, what hasn't been, what hasn't been told, what, ha what hasn't been said or uttered, or what are things that, you know, people that I've met along the way are, are really trying to advocate for or fight for and um, representation wise. Um, you know, I'd love to write a movie about a dog that plays basketball, but you know, <laughs> I'm like, right now I got too much trauma. It's too hard. <laughs> well, I think luckily, like there's so much that hasn't yet been explored. And so I feel like there's just a rich wealth of material for you to draw upon. And so I'm excited for many Alex Young films. Thank you, me too. <laughs> of course. Um, and Colleen, you know, just hearing Alex talk about what's missing, what's not seen, and, and Adam talk about the impact of U.S. imperialism, I feel like um, so, so many times, you know, when we talk about like inter-Korean relations and we talk about peace, women have so often been missing from that conversation. And you were part of such an incredible delegation um, devoted to peace. Can you tell us? just a little bit about how you got involved and how that that trip impacted your art. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I So in 2015, I went uh, to North Korea with the delegation of 30 incredible international female peacemakers, including Gloria Steinem and two Nobel Peace Laureates. And, you know, I always think about myself as like, or I had been calling myself this accidental um, activist, you know, just because I had just never thought of myself as an activist or, you know, doing anything um, for like the collective or for Korea. You know, I had never really thought about North Korea that much other than kind of you know, listening to my parents talk about North Korea in a really disparaging way growing up, like there's a lot of like enmity and like bias. And, you know, in a way, it reminds me of how like sometimes we do ourselves a disservice by um, making activism such a big word, you know, like it's scary and intimidating in a lot of ways, right? Versus like for me now, the way I understand it is activism for me, you know, in essence is movement, you know, it's active, it's being active, not being passive, not being complacent. It means just being intentional and like choosing and recognizing and disrupting, first of all, I think, you know, one's own passivity, right? So I kind of feel like um, before that trip, like there's definitely a calling before 2000, you know, 15, May 2015 and like after, because I feel like there's, you know, I just kind of woke up um, and I just like saw things differently, you know, so much. So, I mean, when I went there, I think that I actually didn't know if I was going to like what state I would come back in. Like it was kind of like this, you know, so I, we had to put like wills in place before we left. Yeah, it was like, are you going to be detained? Yeah, so it was like, do not resuscitate knows. order, you know, how did, I mean, you had to really think about these things before going on this thing, even though I, I didn't think anything was going to happen really, but you, I still like went through these steps and um, just, 
you know, being around North Korean women, you know, we we went there with like no rose color glasses. We knew there was like orchestration, you know, there, there were things that couldn't be said, but the connection was real. You know, when we said goodbye at the end, we were just like bawling. We were like crying because we had had these like very personal connections that were not political, you know? And I think the role of art also like that I really recognized in that experience was the personal, you know? Um, one very concrete example that I wanna give is that I never knew how important music and singing was in activism. I mean, I just never realized that, you know? Even because it seems very obvious now, but I, I remember this not only in a context of like, confrontation and danger like when you're marching or whatever it, it orchestrates you it galvanizes you it's a way to communicate with others with you that like we're on the same page we're doing this together um but one very like interesting thing for me was on the bus I remember like the North Korean women started singing Arirang which is a very very old Korean folk song and we all, we sing it on both sides of the DMZ. And so I really thought about how like, wow, you know, there's really stuff that is like older and more enduring than violence and war. Um, and and I think ultimately the the role of art is to unify and connect and make us feel less alone. And, and I um, just really like, thought about how strong art and activism are like linked, how strongly they're linked anyway. So oh, I love that. Yeah. Uh, it makes me think of this documentary that I saw. I can't recall the name of it, but um, it was about uh, a, a peace delegation that wanted to play. It was an orchestra that wanted to play Arirang at the, at the border and they were blocked. And um, oh. so they got as close as they could and they performed, but they were like, this is, this mm -hmm. is how we, wish for our peace so, and of course yeah, it can I, be I, heard I across the border that. so you know yes like, exactly sound carries <laughs> yes Those um, so i see an amazing question in the uh, and i want to invite other folks to use the q a function or the chat to please share your questions but i'm going to pose this to all of you panelists so this is a question from kat have any of you noticed a difference between how society views activism versus how you personally view activism how does activism change your perspectives? I know, Colleen, you talked talk about this a little bit, but for the rest, I would be curious to hear your thoughts as well. Um, I think uh, Insu might have mentioned this earlier, um, but there are, I, I think, at least how I used to to view activism and I was definitely society when I was uh you know years ago um but I think it's easy to look at activism uh and kind of just think that it's you know posting things or like speaking really loudly and authoritatively and confidently and um being like a history buff and, and all of these things but there are so many roles that exist within social movements and there are you know I, I think that is something that I've come to learn over the years and you know more recently because I felt like when I was younger I was much more outspoken as I've gotten older I feel like I'm much more internal and you know it made me really question like how do I actually even show up for any of this like what is my purpose like does my voice matter you know you you get into like these sort of uh spiral like ruminations and um I think yeah recently you know understanding that you can take up another role and the the health of the movement is dependent upon is dependent upon people feeling comfortable with the role that they're in and having the energy to you know uh perpetuate it yeah, I love that. I, I feel like it um 
offers a sense of humility and understanding like what you don't know and um, understanding that as a human being, you don't know everything and doing that work to educate yourself and to, to make connections, to make links to other communities that have experienced other types of oppression that might connect to yours. I think that is one of the most beautiful and powerful and profound things that we can do. Yeah, anyone else have anything to add to this question? Yeah, I, I love um, all that has been said, you know, in terms of, you know, even Alex in the first question talking about, you know, activism coming from what does activism mean when we're not even supposed to be speaking out anyways, right? And telling our own stories anyways. So in that way, like even that representation, even us telling our own stories, these our own narratives, right? Because they're not like new narratives, we just have been, but it's who's paying attention, what is dominant culture saying about us, right? And so like us even just claiming that space and taking that up, that is, we're in a place where even just that is activism. Us coming together and experiencing joy and being with community and connecting with our Korean roots, you know, like that's activism, right? And so I think I loved what Colleen said in terms of, you know, activism being about movement and being about interrupting one's own passivity. I, I absolutely love that. And in my projects, that's why it's so important that we make art together as a community, right? Because in that art making space is where we then, because, you know, the nature of a lot of textile work is slow. And so we get to slow down, but we're making protest banners. So we get to learn about each other's fights and see how that relates to us, or maybe we're against it, but in the but we're able to be in the same room making together and supporting each other to protest, right? And so for me, that's why it's so important to, or you know, through my own art practice that I've chosen, it's that connection, that community. And like Colleen said, you know, oppression is so um, and Alex, you talked about too, it's so uh good at making us feel alone like we're suffering by ourselves and so when when we're making art together um it's really you know i see so many people connect you know interculturally like um inner or um you know cross generations where people are able to connect and be like, wait, I don't quite understand that in that way, but I am able to connect in this way and we can learn about each other and how do we show up for each other? And so I think that is really powerful um, in, in art. That's so beautiful. And so is there anything else you wanna add or should I move on to another question? No, I do want to, I guess I could kind of echo and add, um... I think we often underestimate the power of a vulnerability and what um, what really truly connects us is not the differences, but the human connections of emotional things. And I feel like that it's often um, out overlooked. So I think I really, from my perspective, um, I try to act um, use that, uh, channel that vulnerability in my work to connect with people. Um, sometimes I would have challenging questions in events that I would be, and it, it takes me a, for, for a second to understand where they're coming from. And it's because they don't have um, knowledge or like language to really connect with me, but they want to. And I just, when I so, slowly understand that, um, and when we connect our similar struggles, um, our similar emotional feeling. I feel like we can sh like really communicate what we're trying to say. And I think that's where my focus is in my work. I think that's wonderful and such a generous way to think of challenging questions. It's like people trying to connect and not having the language for it. And I, I love that Corey Angry as a character you know, I think anger really does stem from vulnerability. So I, I, I love that it's all intertwined um, in, in this character you've created and, uh, and the work that you create around her. Um, so Adam already brought up the, the theme of our night, which is, um, or the title of our event, it's New Narratives. Um, 
I would be very curious to hear from all of you what narratives you would like to see um, about us. Like what new narratives should we be creating about Korean Americans? I think, I think vulnerability is a huge part. Go on, Colleen. Oh, you no, know, I was just going to say how like I, and I think all of us here actually flout convention. Like I don't think any of us really fit into like, mainstream stereotype pop stereotypes about like Koreans or Korean Americans and so I you know for me it's like you know this this is what you know Korean Americans could look like lives and actions could look like and maybe this is something to be celebrated and amplified you know and I personally want to tell stories from here I want to establish you know, a place of validity and strength from here, you know, bring my weird, like, I don't know, interiority and like nonverbal, like mystery, unresolved, like weird animations and stuff. Um, and, you know, talk about feeling versus thinking and also really like I'm to get more tangible, you know, and concrete, I'm really interested in like going back to old forms of storytelling, like pansori, um, you know, drum work and salpuri and, you know, traditional shamanic um, rituals and really like learn more about them and, you know, bring them into kind of like the new, um, like I, I'm just fascinated by old forms of storytelling, you know, things like proto animations, like on cave walls that animate through firelight. Like there are so many things that are, again, very enduring, old, ancient, that are like beautiful. And uh, I think there's so much there in our own culture. So um, that's kind of what I'm interested in. That makes me think about Adam and your work in music and textiles. I was so impressed when I was looking at your bio, just um, at, at the very interdisciplinary nature of um, how you bring in music and your banners. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, it, with the, um, the project I've been doing with HANA Center, Citizenship for All, Storytelling Through Nongi Making, just uh, researching more about the history of Nongis, right, Korean folk banners. And, um, you know, we do this workshop and it's people commit to four days. And the first day we go through like the history of um, the Nongi and its significance. And it's so beautiful because they're made in community uh, to go along farm work that was done as community, right? And yeah, just the shamanism that Colleen is talking about, where it's about um, warding off evil. It's about bringing about worldly blessing and fostering societal harmony. So it's like all about collaboration and community and collectivity. And so I just really love that and something I hold on to. And yeah, I'm part of a Korean, all women's Korean drumming group, um, Urisori as well. And um, also as Urisori, we've been learning more about the roots of uh, drumming of Pungmur, you know, how like we are, like what we're doing is kut, which is the same word as what shamans do. We're meant to, you know, shake the very ground we're on and connect us to the earth and, and the sky and, you know, and like one thing about the Nongi, why it's so vertical too, is like we're meant, it It was that way because it was throwing our wishes, our demands, our commands into the sky for the gods to receive, you know? And so like, that's definitely something I've been reading a lot about and just finding so much inspiration in terms of just, um, just like our indigenous way of seeing and dealing and being in in the earth, you know, and being with each other. So I think that's so beautiful. I love that. That gave me chills, the idea of Nongis being vertical to connect to the sky and the heavens. That's so beautiful. Um, Alex, anything to add on new narratives that you'd like to see and create yourself? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, uh, I'd like to see adoption narratives kind of in scripted media sort of move away from being so heavily focused on birth search. Um, there's a whole lifetime of things that 
lead up to it before or after if it happens if it doesn't um and i i'm something i'm trying to explore more in my work and i think it's something that a lot of adoptees that are coming of age now are are trying to express um you know we're, we're talking about shamanism and i think the it, it's it's so interesting to me how shamanism actually tends to be like this uh quintessential I, I feel like pillar of like queer adoptees that are like trying to reconnect it's like you go to like the most like indigenous and like ancient form of of being korean and um so i'd love to also see narratives that don't vilify shamanism as much i think in uh korean media it tends to be sort of looked at in like this sort of uh exoticized or um horrific way but you know also i'd love to see more alien sci-fi from korean perspectives and maybe everyone is a little gay i'm just saying you know take it or leave it <laughs> all of the above oh my gosh yes um i feel like an amazing essay that I've read about an adoptee, a queer adoptee connecting to shamanism is by Andy Mara. I believe it was in HuffPost. It's a stunning essay. And you illustrated it, didn't you? I was, yeah, I was just I was like, I illustrated it. Yes. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> I'm like, wait, all these connections are all connected. Um, so we're just coming up on like our last two minutes of our discussion before I turn it back over to Jimmy. Um, does anyone have a quick question or anything to add to our discussion um, so far? I, I just love like all of these ways that we're finding connections between what we're saying and um, yeah, anything else? I'm just super excited to be here and super inspired and yeah. Oh, I don't know if that was for the panelists or asking questions of the, yeah, but I, I just uh, really love all your art practices and just so excited to share space with you all. Yeah. Absolutely. It is really such a joy to be able to celebrate Korean American art across the spectrum through this panel like different disciplines that are represented here, the ways that we connect, um, and just all the ways that we're vibing off of each other. It's just, it's such a joy. And I'm really glad that we're able to do this for Nakasek and Adoptees for Justice. So yeah, truly, thank you all of you for, for giving your talents and your genius to this uh, discussion. And thank you to all of the, um, the attendees for for supporting these amazing organizations and for tuning in and um, just engaging with us in such a wonderful way. Great. Um, so Jimmy, I think I'll turn it over to you uh, for our last um, wrap up. Oh, thank you. Well, that flew by for me. <laughs> and really conversation did. was amazing. Thank you, everyone. Well, wow, and, and we had over 180 attendees at one point. That's amazing. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for showing up to support us. Uh, I'd especially love to thank Hannah and Sue, Adam, Alex, and Colleen. We're truly honored to showcase this incredible talent from our community and appreciate your support of Nakasek and Adoptees for Justice. Uh, before we sign off, I'd also like to give a shout out to two Chicago-based Korean-American artists who made contributions to this event as well. Uh, Seijin Lee donated a beautiful painting of the South Korean flag on handmade paper as a bonus raffle prize. And Izzy Cho designed this charming commemorative sticker, which we are going to send to everyone who supported this event. So keep your eyes out for that in the mail to come. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Nakasek board and my amazing team for everything they've done to make this event possible, uh, especially uh, John Kim. I think he's an unsung hero. If you've seen our social promotions, our emails, he's been designing all of that and also has been command central tonight. Better him than me. All right, I've just received the current total from my colleague Megan here of our fundraising efforts for this event. There's still time to buy raffle tickets and make donations, but as of now, I'm thrilled to share that we've exceeded our goal and raised $63,265. Thank you, everyone. That is amazing. Please be sure to follow our incredible panelists on social as well as Nakasek and Adoptees for Justice. I've had a blast being your MC for this special occasion. On behalf of everyone on my team, I offer our deepest thanks and appreciation. Live right, know your roots, live strong, and live together. Good night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>